But what about Bobby Fischer? Well, Bobby Fischer was on Dick Cavett's show about 40 years ago, and Cavett asked him, oh, what's the greatest moment in your life? What do you really live for? And, and, and Fischer said, said, well, it's that moment when I know I've crushed somebody's ego. He says, you know, like playing chess with a guy after, day after day, and, and he thinks he can beat me, but then one day he walks into the hall and he can't look me in the eye. And I can see that now he knows that he's not going to beat me, but he can't admit it yet. And so he's pretending he still has self-confidence. That's the moment I cherish, Fisher said. Could that be something like what, what the, what, probably not the wealthiest of the wealthy, but probably nouveau riche people, is that what, what, this would go through their mind when they're, when they're crushing their, their employees? Well, it's certainly the apex oh. of <laughs> welcome, superior <laughs> competitiveness. Welcome to Progressive Soup. My name is David Stevenson. Tonight I have a guest, uh, Richard Duffy, who's uh, co-chair of the uh, Green Party in Connecticut. We're going to talk about poverty, and we're going to talk about um, causes of it, and then we're going to try to maybe find our way into some incremental solutions, if not full solutions. Rich, tell us about poverty. Well, first off... There are two extremely different things that go by the name. Uh, one is absolute poverty and the other is, uh, is relative poverty. Absolute poverty is the condition in which if you get any more money, you must spend it on food because you're perpetually malnourished. Um, everybody, everywhere has to spend at least 10 to 20 percent of whatever they have on things other than food, if only to buy cooking fuel and mm -hmm. oil and pots and pans and things like that. Uh, but you're like a sponge when you're really poor. That is, you need more water in you and uh, you have to get full of water before any will start running off to be available for something other than food. Now, the, the point at which the, the sponge has no water running off at it, off it that's called absolute poverty. Um, about 1.2 billion people on Earth live in absolute poverty, and that is an extreme form, form of suffering. That so, is, you're, you're going to bed hungry every night. Let's go see. So they're and, on the preface of, precipice of death, essentially. Yeah. It's a day yeah. to day. To yes. Day. One day they may not wake up, and the world will never notice. Yeah. Well, what happens usually is that you die of some disease that you wouldn't get if you were properly nourished. You get quashia core and one thing goes to another and uh, you, you die usually, most commonly, of, of simple diarrhea. Like you get dehydrated and so can't get in the can't and diarrhea get goes by person. the name of dysentery. Yeah, well, cholera and cholera typhoid and, and other things. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. Some, one form or another. About 50% of malnourished people die of... of uh, of diarrhea. Um, opposed to that is relative poverty. Relative poverty is what we mean by poverty in the United States for the most part. There may be a few people who are in absolute poverty. There are malnourished people in, in the U.S. Uh, they're malnourished um, wholly because of the structure of the society. It's not that there isn't enough money. It probably isn't even that they or somebody they know doesn't have enough money. It's that they have to waste so much in order to be do, able to do anything. That is, so much has to go for rent, so much has to go for transportation, so much goes for things like telephone and so on, that, uh, that they can't figure out how to live presentably in any way without also being malnourished. Now, relative poverty, it turns out, is a great deal more injurious than people used to think it was. That is, generally, uh, those of us in the middle class and the upper class look at, uh, at people uh, with less than we have and think, oh, okay, so if they work a little harder or they get a better job or get a little more education or something like that, uh, then they're basically, they'll be on the same terms that we are and there's no significant injustice involved. Mm -hmm. But uh, a group of, several groups of British 
epidemiologists have been working now for 30 years on the statistics of relative poverty, of, it's, of inequality. Explain to me what an epidemiologist is, because I'm, I'm not, I oh. have a sense of what it is, but it's, I'm not... somebody who, who studies medical statistics, mm -hmm. okay. tries to find out the patterns of, patterns of epidemics of okay. diseases, that is, who gets what disease and why, where do you expect a disease to crop up, that kind of question. Well, uh, in the uh, in the 1980s, uh, lots of uh, epidemiologists in Europe and particularly in Britain uh, were noticing that yeah. there were very large differences in health between some groups and other groups and that uh, there were marked differences in health in, of, uh, by income. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a study that, that started on all of the British civil servants uh, in Whitehall that is, a, you know, just like the mall in Washington, the equivalent of that in London. Yeah. And uh, the civil service is very conveniently graded so that uh, everybody in, in each income bracket has, you know, ha has the same status and yeah. so on. Some and so they're, they're people who are very easy to compare mm -hmm. by income. Yeah. So they, they got all the health statistics for, uh, for the British civil servants and they started questioning them in lots of different ways, you know, asking them what kinds of hobbies they had and what they ate and what their physical exercise was like and whether they smoked and developed statistics on a huge number of different parameters. Uh, and, and what they found consistently was hmm. that there was no parameter that was more significant in predicting how long somebody would live uh, than simply wealth status. That That's, is, the richer you were, the higher you were in the hierarchy, the longer you were going to live. The lower down you were, the more stress you had, the more likely you were to have heart attacks, your life was going to be shorter. So it was a very good indicator. Wealth was yeah, a very good indicator the best. of, of, uh, of life expectancy. It was a better indicator. What shocked them was it was a better indicator than anything else that they had. That is, they'd, they'd gone into this expecting they were going to find big differences in diet Mm -hmm. and such, and thinking, thinking, okay, you eat healthy food, you'll be healthy. Yeah. Uh, that's not what they found. What they found is, you have money, you'll be healthy. <laughs> if, you, if, you, uh, if you're at the bottom of the ladder, you're going to be unhealthy, sure. uh, pretty much no matter what you eat. Before you go any further, you just, want, no don't tell you me, do. just don't tell me that money can buy you love, because I don't want to hear anything about that. Uh, no, it can't buy you love, but it does buy you respect. Okay. The problem, the problem is, but you, you got to understand poverty in a couple of dimensions. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not simply economic. Yeah. It's that when you have less money, you also have less esteem from other people. Mm -hmm. That is, you are unable to do the things that get people esteem. Like, you can't go eat in a fancy restaurant and have a waiter fawn over you, you know, if, if you're earning uh, $400 a month. Yeah. And so you don't get the kind of reinforcement for your self-esteem that the wealthy get. Uh, you don't have important people calling you on the phone and asking for your opinion, as say you do if you're at the top of the hierarchy. Uh, you don't have the political power either that people at the top of the hierarchy have. Just, you don't, can't just call up a lawyer and solve, yeah. get a problem solved by somebody else at a distance. Does self-esteem yeah. require somebody being on a lower social strata than you? Is that, is that a necessity to self-esteem? Well, there seems to be something like 5% of the population that's relatively immune to comparisons. That mm -hmm. are people, you know, there are some people who, who seem to be able to uh, keep their self-respect mm -hmm. and so on, despite uh, insult and injury from other people. But in general, um, you know, the, the vast majority of us, yeah. something like 95%, are extremely sensitive to what other people think of us or what we imagine other people think of us. Because most of us know that, you know, that other people don't right. tell us right out what they think. You're not even allowed to ask, you know. It's like mm -hmm. very rude and peculiar to ask somebody, you know, what do you think of me? Very few people do it. We also live in a society in which we're extremely dependent on relationships with strangers. That is, the, the more complex the world becomes, the more dealings we have to have with people we don't know. Yeah. No matter what occupation we're in. That is, you, your, your, your ability to have an impact on strangers and to get strangers to respond to you in the way that you want them to uh, becomes more important every year. And you find yourself 
as you increase in status too, having more and more relationships with people that you don't know. Yeah. And you, you have to develop a way to, uh, to be presentable that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with what you actually feel you are. So you're saying the socialization is, is very important, even more important maybe now to, in the world that we live in now than it used to be, and yet there's, you say, about 5% of, yeah. of the people um, in any given society that are basically immune to any, well, anybody, what anybody cares or thinks about them. Well, that is that, that, well it's that some people have, have grown up with so much love and respect. Mm -hmm you know, from their parents, that it, it carries over into other situations hmm. and they can negotiate very difficult times with other people on the assumption that they really are lovable, respectable people and hmm. no dent is put into that. But it's not more than about 5% of us that, uh, that acquire that kind of security from our childhoods. Now, now stepping yeah. outside of, of, of American culture, we were talking a little bit off camera about, about Indian culture and about you, we've talked about the Brahmins who are the um, the people that sort of represent that kind of um, wealth beyond wealth, n no need for anything. And uh, who in America fits that same description? Is it is it a, a, a class system? Is it a caste system in America? Well, we, what do we see in America? Well. Basically, we, I mean, we have a class system mm -hmm. that is doing its best to turn itself into a caste system. Mm -hmm. It means a, the class system that we have is now actually steeper than the class system in any other developed country, mm. with the exception of possibly Singapore and Hong Kong. We're talking about poverty, about absolute poverty, and my question that I wanted to ask you was that uh, in Indian society, we talked about this before we went on the air, about the Brahmins, about how they're essentially about 5% of the population in India. And make a comparison between this, this group in India. Is there, such, is there a similarity? Is there a similar group in America? Well, uh, in classic Brahmin society, uh, things were not monetized and so you had a social order essentially or the appearance of one mm -hmm. that seemed to be dominant that dominated the politics and in turn the economic system we work in the reverse way our economic system dominates our politics and mm -hmm. the two together dominate our social system okay, okay? but uh, this is a class society that is in the, the basic question you're asking is, yeah. you know, are, are, there, are there extreme differences and such in the U.S.? And the answer to that is yes, uh, more extreme than in any other developed country, with the possible exception of Singapore and Hong Kong, um, which hardly count because they're, they're just sort of a special they're they're city, city state. They're city right. states, yep. yeah. Now, um, in, in, in India, you have what they call caste. It's a caste society. Where, where people are entrenched according to their, their yeah. background. Is, is, does America have a caste society? Well, to some extent. That is, caste, or, or racism is mm -hmm. a caste system. The mm -hmm. distinction between black and white in the United States right. is a caste system. In India, the system is called a Varna system. Varna means color. Mm -hmm. As the, the colors have gotten considerably mixed up in different ways over, yeah. you know, two and a half thousand years or so. But essentially, it was a system in which the Aryans who came down from the north and were lighter skinned were, were supposed to dominate over the darker skinned people. Uh, and they did this by ensuring the continuation of their status for their children. A caste system is simply a, a system in which those with power, money, and esteem make certain that their children will inherit the same status. So it's a perpetuation, so that, perpetuation yeah. of, of, of yeah. a system. And you see, if, if, you, if you create extreme differences in wealth and you eliminate uh, quality education, mm. then you're certain that the lower class cannot get well enough educated to enter the upper class. They can't become doctors or lawyers and so on. Yeah. And so that instead of having your pick of the best potential doctor, you have your pick of the best potential rich student who happens to become a doctor. Uh, that's, wow. when you, that's when you have a caste system. Now, right? in America, now in America we, we know quite well that, um, that uh, just because you're the child of, of a rich family, I mean, you could, you, a lot of times children of rich people are, are essentially, they, they have the silver spoon in their mouth and, and they're lazy because of that and they don't, and 
the, the family in a few generations can pretty much, the, the wealth can, can collapse through kids and grandkids and great-grandkids just spending the money willy-nilly without earning any additional money. Um, this sounds very different than what you have in a caste system. Well, you see, if you ensure the profitability of investment, mm -hmm. but don't ensure a return uh, 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 to one's labor that reflects the value of what you produced, yeah. then you're going to also simultaneously be, in, be ensuring the superiority and the security of the rich, mm -hmm. because they're the ones who have investment. So you secure that, and your labor doesn't count. Then it doesn't matter if the upper class deteriorates because they're running on inherited money, and the money will go on making money as is the illusion of our system. Right now, if we have a system in which the richest 2% own half the wealth mm -hmm, of the country. Right, yeah. So say, imagine a room with, with 50 people in it, and you draw a line down the middle of the room. One person owns half the room, and there are 49 people on the other side of the room. And any time one of the 49 tries to touch anything on the one person's side, mm -hmm. he says, OK, for that you owe me interest or rent, and so on. That's the situation that we have now. It's actually in different ways worse than that because 1% uh, of the country, uh, you know, of, of the company, uh, excuse me, 1% of the, of the country owns uh, about 37% of the wealth and the top 5% own something like 63% of the wealth. Mm -hmm. And so the, the people on the bottom are getting very squished. Uh, in fact, about half the country uh, doesn't it doesn't have any actual capital if all the debts are paid off and everything is canceled out they're going to turn up with with basically nothing now does this, is this what brings poor people into the into a situation of not being able to actually pay their bills does this bring them into the credit situation where where they they they're given a little bit of credit and they end up basically um, doing themselves more harm by taking on credit to pay bills well, that they couldn't pay anyway we have less social mobility in the United States now than, than the average European country. That is, the, the people who don't have money can't get enough money to become independent. That mm -hmm. is, they, they can't secure uh, any kind of job or income. Because to, to start a job with, a, say, a, a yearly salary of $40,000, you have to start with $40,000 in order to, to make the conditions necessary for yeah. that job. And so the only way you can get that initial startup money is by doing something that someone substantially richer than yourself wants you to do and which the richer person believes is going to benefit him. And even then, nine out of ten businesses that start fail within three years. And so people on the bottom of American society don't have opportunities anymore. It's very unlikely that they're going to be able to get, uh, to get enough money to prosper because basically it, 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 we've got a system in which you need to have substantial money to invest in order to have any security and any growing wealth. For a hundred years, the guarantee of Morgan Guarantee Trust mm -hmm. was that if you had five million dollars or more, or if you were a special entry with, with two million dollars, you, uh, you could get 30 percent interest on, on your money each year. That was the guarantee. And so the, the rich in this country came to believe that they were entitled to double their money at least every three years. That if they couldn't double their money in three years, that something was wrong with the country and they had to fiddle with the legislators and the politicians and the, and the lobbyists in order to fix it because that's what they thought was supposed to be their birthright. Ooh, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. T text alert. Uh, we don't do call-ins on our show. We sometimes get an occasional text in. And uh, we have a question from, uh, from Kata in Bethel who asks... Uh, Richard Duffy, are you uh, thinking about running against uh, Jim Himes again for, uh, for Congress this year? I don't know yet. Uh, we were shut out of the debate, so all of the Green Party people by the League of Women Voters in 2008. 
And because of that, also, it was extremely difficult to get any uh, publicity in papers. As we had, we had write-ups in a number of papers in 2006. Good. Didn't get them in. Keep on talking. I got to text back and let so, her know. And let her know that yeah. she's going to have to wait till the show's on to get her answer. <laughs> so but go it, ahead. It, it, it depends on on the League of Women Voters and the, and the papers to a large extent because it's a lot of work. You have to petition okay. when you're when you have less than one percent of the of the vote in the previous election. You got to start over from get again from scratch and go out and get signatures of uh, somewhere between thirty five hundred and, and uh, four thousand people in the hopes that that more than two thousand of them are going to be valid signatures. Just to get on the ballot and uh, yeah. let alone get it, it's a lot get, of work. get involved in action an actual debate and exchange of, of ideas. Work. Yeah, and you need petitioners. The petitioners, uh, you know, we don't have the money to pay them. Petitioners are generally going to do it only if they believe that the result of it will be that you end up with one percent. Uh, on of, of the vote, in right. which case you won't have they won't have to do it all over again. Yeah, the one percent can, the one percent candidacy seems to be a pretty good thing. Matter of fact, I was uh, last year, I was a candidate for two offices as a one percent candidate for the Working Families Party, yeah. and we got I got well three uh, percent in one of the cases mm-hmm. and nine percent in the other because mm-hmm. I was against somebody that had no opponent. Yeah. But um, it's 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 I don't know conceptually it's a good idea and and certainly right here and now I'd like to. Oh. Some was be be a part of doing that for the uh, for the Green Party at some point too, but that's well, the, another that's the, another the, show though. The the fourth the fourth district is the most right wing district in all of New England. When you say right wing, you mean uh, financially conservative? Uh, yes, but also it it has a larger percentage of Republicans. Mm-hmm. It has the second largest percentage of Libertarians. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has. Um, a voting voting record that was the last to give up its Republican congressman. And so, right. so it's a very conservative district and the single most difficult place for a Green to run for Congress. With the blow up of Goldman Sachs, does that have any effect on it? Do you think there's a, maybe a chance for a resurgence of, um, of uh, with sometimes with, with, with um, relative poverty? You talked about relative poverty. With the relative poverty of, of, of the wealthiest losing a lot of their strength because of the blow up with Goldman Sachs, at least the investment class. Do you see a possibility of a resurgence of uh, some populist intent here in Fairfield County? Well, for the most part, it uh, depends on the newspapers and the media. That is, the media in general is quite hostile to the Greens mm-hmm. and is very hard to get uh, to get onto television, radio, into the papers or anything. It's hard to communicate with people. It's very hard to get a speaking engagement. Uh, and with those kinds of limitations on communication, uh, it's it's hard not only to to uh, to tell people what you think. Uh, it, it's hard to find out what they think and what they actually want. It's a problem of resources. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's uh, obviously yeah. with the Supreme Court decision, where apparently um, will get considerably yeah, worse. It'll get worse. Yeah. Yep. If, well, enough for the enough for the sadness, enough of the well, gloom and doom. Let's. What let, me, let, me, we, let, me, let me get let me get back to the what was supposed okay. to be the point of the show. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I, I, have is, I, have, I have I have, I have a few cheery questions. To, to, okay, but go ahead. All right. Anyway, yeah, we're we're a class society. We're, we are more of a class society than any other developed country, mm. and we're now in the process of converting a republic into an oligarchy and simultaneously converting our class system into a caste system. That is making sure that the class system is permanent and that that the people on the top uh, will have great-grandchildren who will always be assured of the position that their great-grandparents Without have. Without ever having actually having yeah. to work. They'll, 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 right. The money will reinvest itself and they'll right. stay wealthy by just by means of investment right. and uh, trickle trickle up Yes, capitalism. Yeah, like we, we have see. a we have a plutocracy. Mm-hmm. As we don't, when you when you look at the country from objectively looking at the at both the economic system, the political system, and the social system, mm-hmm. see we're a plutocracy. We're also an empire. We're a de facto empire. Uh, we're we're losing all of the remains of the republic that we once had, and. Uh, we, I hope we're not entirely losing hopes of, of any kind of democratic procedure, but certainly we're in worse shape for that than any European country. Oh, okay. We've got, I got another, uh, another text in yeah. from, from, from Kata in Bethel, and uh, she wants to know, um, if you're running for office, one of, the, one of the issues that she has is, well, how do we keep our kids here in Connecticut? What can we do? 
What can we do to keep our uh, to keep jobs here for our young people? Well, <laughs> look, can this we? state? Yeah, this state we ha we have the fourth highest difference between the rich and the poor mm -hmm. in Connecticut. We're also the richest state in the country per capita. Mm -hmm. So, if there's any country, uh, any part of the country that can afford to change its its system to benefit the young and so on, it's Connecticut. If we can't do it here, it can't be done. It can obviously be done here because it's been done all over Europe and in Japan. Basically, you make the work. That is, you find, <laughs> you find out things that, pe that people want to have done. You find out things that people want to do. You connect them. You fund people to, to, to get into careers that, uh, that other people want. And, and there's plenty of money to do that. So maybe it's green, just that so maybe the green, rich don't want to spend the money. So maybe green jobs are, are, are a good source sure. of a, a potential of for, uh, for, uh, for, keeping, um, for, for perpetuating, well, if you will, something good, and, and that is keeping our, our young people here. Yeah, but I certainly want to, wouldn't want to limit it to that. I mean, our educational system is not good. Mm -hmm. the, whole, the educational system of the United States entirely really is very bad compared with with the educational system of any European country or, or Japan. And so there are loads of things that we should be doing for each other, but they're things which do not have a lot of immediate mm -hmm. profit. Yeah. And so they're things that have to be funded socially. So it, it takes a state that's, that's willing to do that. If the governor and the legislator wanted to do that, of course they can do it. There are all kinds of things. I mean, you could do any, any of the kinds of things that were done in the 1930s and so on to revitalize. In other words, in, in other can, words invest, investing in place. people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you, you get much more benefit for that. For instance, if you, if you invest in, the, in a military industry, it takes more than $100,000 to mm -hmm. make a single job. But if you invest in, say, in, in nurses' aides in hospitals, mm -hmm. right, you can get a job going for like, Twenty thousand dollars a year, and so you can employ many more people, and you can get many more people doing things for people. You simply have to value the people, and you have to value the things that people can do for each other. We're going to we have don't. to wrap it up there, but uh, if we have uh, one more thought about what what else can we do besides green jobs? Um, <laughs> I think we need a lot of we need a lot of good psychologists. I mean, people are, people are in really in desperate shape and in despair, largely because of the stress of the extreme inequality of the country. Great. That is, our, our health we've is got, terrible. Our, yep. Yes. We've got, we've got to cut it yeah. off there. Okay. Um, this is Progressive Soup. I'm David Stevenson, Richard Duffy, co-chair of the Green Party in, in Connecticut, and a great conversation. Thank you very much, okay. Richard. Thank you. It's great having you on. We'll have okay. you back soon. Thanks very much. Right. This has been Progressive Soup. Good evening.